Uh, every release, uh, you know, for example, every generation, 5G, 4G, 6G, has a few number of uh, you know, uh, releases, just number, you know, uh, stage releases, you can call it like a stage, you know, you know first step. everything doesn't come out all at once. It comes in, you know, uh, steps uh, because that's how it can be built. So first step, second step. So releases essentially means steps. For example, the 5G started from release 50, and it's still going on. It will go up to most likely release 19. So releases 3GPP specification, release versions from release 15, 16, 17, 18, 19 would be called 5G release. And from until release 14, maybe I think it started 9 to 14 was 4G. Uh, and then 5G until release 19, uh, from 15 to 19, and then the 60 would start possibly in release 20. Right now, what's ongoing is release 18. The specifications are being built. But I will emphasize more on release 16 because release 16 is very important for positioning for us. What happened was the way it works is release 15, the basics 5G, 5G elements were standardized. 5G communication was standardized. And then once basic building blocks of 5G were done, and then in next release positioning work on that stuff. That's how it works. First release is mostly for more fundamental specs is built. And then add on features are built later. So release 15 positioning, 5G uh, began and from release 16 positioning began. Okay, I'll continue now. This is the timeline of various releases. You see, I have described here uh, better. So uh, 5G started, 5G uh, started in release 15. And then the release 16 positioning framework with NRA, essentially new radio, which is uh, the key radio, the main radio for uh, 5G. Release 17, 18, and 19 will start most likely uh, next year. And we'll go on further. It, so all positioning started from uh, release 9 in LT. Uh, essentially, this was 3G, 4G. And then, uh, and initially it was very, uh, uh, rudimentary positioning, I would say. And whenever a positioning release begins, the work on specifying, standardizing positioning begins, it all begins with meeting certain requirement. And the requirement is connected to the use case. For example, now if you want to say standardize positioning or specify positioning for automated cars on the road use case, you know, what kind of accuracy you would like to have for positioning those cars? Maybe doesn't you know that the, those these numbers comes or these constraints come from the requirement you know, on road you would not you cannot tolerate maybe more than a decimeter. So one you in every release certain use cases are picked up and then our requirements are decided discussed and you come up with a requirement then you standardize various procedures signals etc. So that to meet those requirements. So in release nine when it started first. The requirement then, and until many of these releases, until release, I would say at least 13 or 14, the main requirement was the regulatory requirement. For example, if someone in the US makes a 911 call, then the requirement was that the user should be located with 50 meters of a person. 50 meter sounds a big number uh, you know, for positioning, but it was, it turned you know, from the requirement discussion that, um, you know, that was uh, possibly uh, you know, reasonably good enough to you know, for these kind of uh, first responder calls. So initially, for many releases, the main requirement 50 meter, but now in release, and that was also because uh, the LT radio uh, they had such signal parameters which were it was difficult to get requirements, uh, very good requirements. Then. But now it's more possible. We'll discuss later. So this is a timeline of all the different releases, uh, 4G releases and 5G releases. Let's release 13 and before. As I said, the regulatory requirement was 50 meters. And the positioning methods, which were predominantly used in wireless networks. When I say wireless networks, it's 
the way stations which you see mounted all over the city. The using those way stations and your mobile nodes. Using so a mobile nodes needs to be localized or positioned using the base stations what you have mounted all over the city. Now you know in the in your surroundings. So predominantly the methods used until then was OTDO and ESET. OTDO is essentially time difference of arrival. And time difference of arrival methods works in this way in that uh, uh, it can be done in multiple ways. Downlink time difference of arrival and uplink time difference. So downlink time difference of arrival when a base station transmits a signal and you, you uh, what UE does is measures the time of arrival. Or uh, then it receives again a transmission from another base station and it computes the time difference between of time of, arri of arrivals of, from multiple base stations. And these time difference of arrivals from multiple base stations help in localizing the beam. So what UE does is it receives signals from multiple G node beams or multiple base, or in those days, it was not G node B, it was just node Bs and the E node Bs. So a UE would receive signals uh, from multiple base stations and it would compute the time difference of arrival of uh, signals of, from multiple base stations. And all these time difference measurements, it would report back into the network. A network will do all the computation and will try to localize the beam. That was the predominant method. And there was some weaknesses of this method. This method requires all the base stations to be perfectly time synchronized. And that's not so easy. That was not possible. It, it contributed to a lot of errors, this particular thing. And then another method was used to enhance the LID where uh, base station would use all possible information it has to localize series. That was called enhanced cell ID based position because the simple positioning, a base station would know which cell the UE is because uh, a given base station would serve a UE in its cell. All the UE lies within its cell. So that's the most basic information, positioning information what base station anyway has. Beyond that, there are certain more things base station would know which can provide information to localize UEs. And all these different parameters which base station can collect without really performing a positioning procedure. And uh, that was called enhanced cell ID. And this does not require much uh, involvement of the UE or you receiving a signal, transmitting any signal, receiving measurements, reporting measurement, not something. It's you know just based on whatever exists in the network information, try to localize the UE. That was enhanced cell ID. And then uh, Time difference of arrival required use participation of receiving signal, doing measurements, and reporting back. And the signals what was used predominantly until then uh, was uh, LTPIs. LT had a signal. I said in TDOA, base station would transmit a downlink signal to use on which use would do time of arrival measurements. And this particular signal, a positioning signal, has to be designed. So, you know, there are a lot of things. It has to be designed in a certain way. There are many signal design constraints. And it's very interesting physical layer problems coming to there about signals, etc. Then the signal also designed is, was, is, was called LTPRS. Then I'll go a bit quick because I have a lot to talk. Then, then come release 14. And release 14, uh, the all the companies in 3GB consortium, they decided that we need to position IoT devices because that can help in many use cases, particularly industrial use case, for example, and many other use cases. And that variety of IoT devices were chosen and they were supported for positioning. A lot of things, when you specify a certain use case, you build standards for certain use case, by specify a lot of same thing. For example, in this picture you see, and these devices, IoT devices, they have low computation power they are not very capable. So they, all of them, and there can be made a variety of such devices and all of them cannot, because of less complexity, cannot afford to have high bandwidth. They can be, there can be variety, variable bandwidth devices. As you see in picture, 20 megahertz was a normal LTU mobile phones. And then there were IoT devices with five, supporting five megahertz bandwidth, 1.4 megahertz bandwidth. And there was one more device, which it was supposed to, you know, work with 100 and 180 kilohertz bandwidth. And one way 
it was thought and standardized even that we uh, that higher band, because bandwidth is very important from the time of arrival estimation. It's like this: if you if on a high bandwidth, uh, or mathematically, I can say that uh, time of arrival accuracy in is inversely proportional to the square of the bandwidth, and that's a you know, big uh, dependence. So when the bandwidth increases, time of arrival, the timing measurement, you know how finely you can, you know detect when a signal has arrived. That depends on the time. And if you want centimeter accuracy and even better possibly, you know, where it can, it can go even lower possibly in future, then you need very high bandwidth. Higher the bandwidth, better will be your timing measurements. Essentially, you can resolve the paths coming to you very well. But low uh, capability device could not afford high bandwidth. So people thought maybe can we you know, help them by doing transmitting the signals more often, repetitive measurements. You know, maybe they can, it can help in compensating the lack of bandwidth. It was a thought then, but now you know, recently we do not think it works that way. But then it was standardized based on the analysis and all the discussions then. So LT14 was predominantly uh, uh, standardizing LT, uh, uh, st IoT devices, and these are still supported because still now there is no replacement for even the 5G has come, but the IoT low complexity IoT devices are supported using the standard using what was specified in release 14. There is no nothing majorly new has come on such devices. And a few more things are, as I said, two paths reporting. You know, in a uh, what if you want to do measurements in a in a typical wireless scenario, you get signals from multiple directions. There are multiple paths coming to you to a you. And uh, when you want to measure the timing, uh, ideally you would like to measure the timing of the path, which is which comes through line of sight between you and the base station, if it exists, uh, because that gives the perfect. You know, distance estimate also and but it uh, does not happen that way always but you are not always in line of sight with the base stations and even if you are line of sight you are you get multiple paths often it helps it improves the performance if the timing measurements of more than one path is reported to the network you measure more than one timing of more than one path and then reports it to the network there are many algorithms many concepts built on that how you can exploit multi-path, timing of multiple signals, multiple versions of the signal coming to you uh, to localize you better. And particularly nowadays with all machine learning and all, uh, this uh, helps even more. So until then, it was only two paths were reported in release 14. And that was even that those times considered a good improvement. The performances you see uh, the, of LTE devices in release 14, uh, the, it was not huge. But I think good enough uh, for uh, the re for supporting the use cases uh, from those devices. Typically, we uh, uh, always compare performances based on eighty percent, eighty percent or ninety percent. As you see, the accuracy were in tens of meters of a variety of uh, IoT devices. Then came release fifteen. Release 15, as I said, the 5G had started, but not for position. <clears throat> so in release 15, for positioning, one uh, very different thing was done. It was uh, the support of GNSS RT. So GNSS, uh, you know how GNSS is uh, GPS, Galileo, GLONASS, and Navic in India. So uh, uh, these things come into uh, GNSS. And then a system, real-time kinetic, uh, uh, you, may have, you may have heard of it. Uh, these uh, devices, uh, what the way it functions is, uh, these, there are RTK devices. In fact, I should have shown in the first picture which Sujit made. Maybe I'll go back to that if you clarify more. Let's look at that picture. You see here, the RTK devices. You see PPT RTK devices mounted beside the road. And then you see one, or one, you know, in the foothill, you know, foothills of this particular mountain, uh, one more device we have shown it there. So what happens is that cars, which are nearby these RTK, RTK uh, stations, 
uh, they receive uh, the nearly the same signal particularly the same nearly the same errors and the signal goes through various layers in the atmosphere uh, you know it, it undergoes a lot of errors before reaching the u on the ground the signal from the gps and gps is the downlink base position where the satellites transmit signal and the receivers in the car they make the time of arrival missions so nearby devices undergo very similar errors. they have very similar error sources so if you have a fixed mount to fixed device like pppt what is shown in this picture and then and if this device is said this is fixed it can accumulate and it can take time and calculate those errors very accurately and then if there is a device in the vicinity of it it can just uh, communicate those errors to those devices those uh, if those devices can use the same error uh, estimates which this rtk station does and thereby it helps in improving the accuracy of gps uh, the devices which are or the cars or anything else which has uh, which is using gps information and the support where the wireless network comes into picture is mostly in distributing these things. so ppr ppp ticket devices uh, stations have made estimate of some sources of error and then it needs to be communicated to these cars uh, or it, it, there are a variety of applications uh, you know for example in civil engineering etc in surveying etc and this can the accuracy which comes out of this is extremely good you know on road you can get centimeter level of accuracy and closer the devices to this article station better with the accuracy and of course it needs line of sight between the cars as well so where does a wireless network comes into picture wireless networks helps to propagate these error uh, sources estimates or parameters to these cars so that their gps accuracy improves so this support of wireless network in various forms there can be you know uh, multi cast or you know unicast uh, variety of uh, different ways of propagations uh, sorry propagate you know, distribution of parameters uh, very standardized this on a very high level i'm showing you this picture i thought very informative i'm showing this for the time so in release 15 this was done and there are various ways in which uh, these error sources can be propagated osr ssr and they have different uh, uh, use cases also there are many other interesting things uh, uh, the comparison of osr ssr is the latest osr has been standardized since before and because what companies want car companies etc want they want uh, the error as i said rtk if you have a car nearby rtk station so it's better Uh, the crisis will be hard and it will be better then if it can be done that not only nearby cars you know a far off car can also get reasonably good accuracy with this uh, then the the cost of uh, deploying rtk stations and making use will reduce as well so now efforts are on that level that people want to increase the uh, geographical coverage of these rtk stations and there are a lot of algorithmic or you know more uh, uh, you know, fundamental concepts those things are also uh, evolving to uh, support those kind of possibilities and osr you know for example building up ssr in, uh, in those lines so it's not possible to go into this details now. so this was this all started in uh, supporting improving gnss through rtk and you know, network uh, getting into to provide or to broadcast unicast or you know transmit um, the parameters of error sources uh, was uh, brought in in release 15 and it's still it's going on now. there are a lot of discussions now. when for example because we are discussing automating uh, one very important thing for positioning is uh, now that this is being discussed is integrity of positioning solutions because the uh, uh, you know use cases would require Uh, more uh, certainty on the estimates or you cannot uh, guess what sometime may not be or maybe you know the probable uh, accuracies may not be enough you would want more certainties on these numbers for example they recently that that's a very hypothetical example i'm giving you from my mind you know and uh, 
recently in Stockholm, up here, you know, there has been discussions that, uh, uh, and it, it was in news that uh, uh, fossil fuel based cars would not be allowed to enter in certain regions of the city. And if someone wants to put tax on it, or fine on it, based on location, that okay, if you enter a certain location, you know, you would be fine. And if someone wants to put fine on that location, then the location estimate need to be very reliable. Uh, otherwise, you know, because you're charging, you're charging money, uh, and then uh, very probabilistic uh, estimate may not be uh, fine. You need very high certainty on these kind of things. Uh, so uh, then continuing on this GNSS RTK, nowadays the discussions are more on uh, reliability, integrity, et cetera. Uh, these things are being discussed in GNSS RTK uh, among DGNSS RTK groups. And then uh, what was also standardized in the district is uh, reporting parameters of sensors. A car may have different types of sensors. You know, UEs may have different types of sensors, whereas drones may have different types of sensors which can be useful for locating in barometers, IMUs, and many things. So these sensors, uh, support of these sensors, what does support mean? Support means a UV can report these sensor networks, sensor measurements to the network or through the network. So network can now supports collecting these measurements from the UVs. And then these measurements can be used for positioning or it can be used for other purposes also. But now they, there's a support in the network. There. And this is uh, coming up very well now. And now people are discussing even expanding the suite of the sensors which can be reported uh, to the network by the UE. And your UE has a lot of sensors. In it. And you may know that uh, uh, more and more nowadays in release 16 and all, a lot of sensing use cases are being discussed. So the, the hopefully more and more sensors will be added, that will be reported to the network. Okay, then comes the release 16. As I said, this is the main release. Things change for position from release 16. Why it changed? Uh, because the 5G started, new radio started. And one biggest difference between LTE or 4G and 5G is in the bandwidth. In 4, 4G, as you said, seen before, the maximum bandwidth uh, which can could be used was 20 megahertz. And in 5G, the maximum bandwidth which can be used, of course, at higher frequencies is 400 megahertz. That is a 20 folds of improvement. As Anna I said in the beginning, for timing measurements, the accuracy is inversely proportional to the square of the bandwidth. So higher the bandwidth, better will be the uh, time of error, time of uh, arrival estimate accuracy. So that's the reason why when 5G, before 5G, as I said, in 4G, people were talking of 50 meters, regulatory requirement. Now just there are discussion. And then with 5G, a lot of things started which were very good for position, multi antenna You could get very big, you can get very good angle of arrival estimates, for example. So angle, timing, these measurements, parameters improved drastically from 4G to 5G. And this was a big boon for positioning. So when people were, before the people were starting off locating with accuracies of tens of meters, now, you know, sometime a decimeter sounds uh, too, uh, too much big for many, many uh, use cases. So let's see for how it changed. Now. The requirements which was considered for the first time in the early 16. Uh, the regulatory still 50 meters because that's decided by SCC and that's more a government requirement that stays as it is. 50 meter still till now the regulatory require if you make a 911 call in US, this is the accuracy with which user of making the call should be located 50 meters. Commercial then came with the commercial use cases with the uh, early 16 horizontal accuracy. I will just look at horizontal accuracy here. Uh, horizontal accuracy for indoor deployment is three meters. And the horizontal accuracy for outdoor deployment is 10 meters. This is the improvement from 50 meter with the, uh, you know, and the, the, I would say they were quite loose and people, uh, companies ended up showing much better accuracy than initially the requirements. Uh, they started to build the specification. So release 16 positioning, before that I said, 
predominantly TDOA and ESID, and then a lot of variety of measurements start measurements started coming in. Uplink TDOA, downlink TDOA, multi RTT. So there was no multi RTT in uh, uh, in LTE. The multi RTT was introduced round trip time. So you it as round trip time with the base station with multiples of base station. And then you, they can look like say, triangulation, some popular latest known sometimes. Angle of arrival became possible, as I said, in 5G, 5G because of multi antenna. Yes, it was improved. And then variety of measurements are also supported. So, overall, there was a big drastic change for positioning from 4G to 5G just because increase in bandwidth and multiple antennas. Better timing measurements and better angle measurements. So before uh, five G, even the positioning was not uh, uh, discussed much. And but after five G, positioning is uh, one of the most important features of the network. Then the five G positioning architecture, as I said, when you standardize a particular feature, there are a variety of levels of standardization. In my team, I was a team lead, and we had people from physical layer layer two, architecture layer three, layer four, four, you know, we have, we call it RAN4. Uh, so multiple groups, uh, working groups, and uh, they specify multiple things. You, you know, uh, you need to standardize architectures and then you go down to measurements and signals, a lot of it. So this was the architecture, positioning architecture, which were standardized in, for 5G and this is, uh, you know, most of these holes as of now as well. I will not go into much details here, uh, but okay, the way it works is the most central part of the architecture where all this location calculation, et cetera, location, a lot of things, location calculation, you know, and then configuring, configuring the signals for measurement, et cetera, all these done in LMF, location management function. So LMF is the entity where the, and then on the network side, on the network side, as I said, the UE reports all the measurements to the network. Network, how does UE report? A UE would essentially is connected only to the base station. You would transmit to the base station, then LMF is a kind of server where all these measurements are uh, transmitted to. And the LMF does all the uh, positioning calculation and it does a lot of other uh, protocol stuff as well. And this is how the signaling is done. Uh, uh, you know, this is the how a typical positioning procedure is done. When a U is located, there are multiple signaling between LMF, TRPs, TRPs essentially are genopes. Uh, the network nodes, what you see, and the U is your phone. So this is the procedure how a particular positioning. Uh, uh, you know, up positioning procedure is done you know, when it starts with someone requesting a position. And then the request can, can come from many network itself may want to localize UEs or the request come, may come from a UE sites on third party, many places. And then this process, process is uh, undergone depending on methods, et cetera. So this is a very general picture I have drawn. And someone interested in knowing the details, how things go you know, on between different uh, nodes so this picture would be helpful. And the proceed, the new things were introduced in at least 16, as I said, for multi-RTT angle of arrival and downlink angle of departure based position. Yeah. As I said, uh, one big thing was, which was done because the signal bandwidth got high was designing a new positioning reference signal. Before, in LT, one of the previous slides I so showed that it was LTPR as a positioning reference signal was designed. But in NR, a new positioning reference signal was designed. And so this is how you see this is an OFDM slot. And uh, you see there are multiple and um, Y axis is frequency, uh, X axis is time. And you see each column is called a symbol. And each square, each tiny square is called a resource. And this is how different uh, TR, the different base station multiplex in a slot. This is one example, just one example. And one particular type of, uh, one particular configuration of uh, downlink positioning reference signal. This is how all these G node based multiplex on the, on the resource element level. 
as I have shown three particular uh, gene openings that transmit uh, in particular resource in specific time on specific frequencies to accomplish this slot received at the U. And designing this signal is required, and I was the team lead of my team that required a lot of work a lot of analysis, physical level, basically. It's all physical level analysis. Many things you have to avoid you know, or whatever can help in improving the position performance uh, on a signal level, on a physical level was considered. And I will not go into much detail on this one uh, IP because it, I can go on for hour and hour on this. Uh, yeah, but uh, if you want, uh, we can discuss it. So this was the dining downlink position reference signal uh, was uh, designed. And then uh, there are new concept of resource and resource because with 5G you have beams, multi antenna and hence the beams come into picture. And every beam, you, angle of arrival estimate improved with that. The concept of resource and resource sets was well brought in. Uh, but one beam is a resource and multiple beams here as you see can be called a resource set. And a beam can, every symbol can be an individual beam. So you can consider it that way also. Yes, so these things added, uh, uh, you know, this picture I've drawn uh, showing you know, various parameters, etc. So uh, the message from this picture is that in 5G, more angle-based measurements are also possible. New definitions are brought in for resource and resource, et cetera, with the position. I will not again go into much details here. This was uh, repetition and muting, etc. These things, you know, you, if you, for example, if you want to improve you know, the measurements uh, or the positioning estimate of a U, what you can do, you can just keep on repeating the measurements. You collect more and more and more measurements, you know, by simple signal processing. You know, as long as uh, noise still remains uncorrelated, you can improve, keep on improving your positioning. Uh, you know, keep on improving the estimates by doing more average. So the multiple signals were transmitted. And then there was concept of muting also to, to avoid interference in the UAC. For when a, um, among genome this when a genome B talks, other genome B skip, keep quiet and those things are more. Uh, this is more about if someone wants to understand how this network uh, you know, works for positioning then these things need to be understood in detail. I will not go into this. This is a, you know, more of a, the configuring, the signaling of the multiple base station, etc. There's a concept of frequency layers, et cetera. What we discussed previously was a downlink signal. And then you have uplink signal. You also transmit the SRS call, uh, the SRS opposition that was standardized in the late 60s you know, for locating. There are a lot of signaling design and those aspects in here. Methods, money methods are the standard. You see, uh, this is how TDOA works, uplink or downlink TDOA. You see one UE and multiple base stations. And like I said before, what UE does is collect time difference of arrival measurements from these, from base station tuples, from base station pairs, and then transmits it to the network. And what it gives it, uh, these, uh, time difference of arrival measurements, they provide a hyperbolic constraints on the use trajectory. So for ev with every time difference of arrival measurement, you can construct a parallel, you can construct a hyperbola between those genomes. Uh, for example, you see uh, this particular, what is this? Uh, sorry, I'm bad. So let's see, call these are the blue RSTD 1, 2 I have shown. So this is a hyperbola constructed from a time difference arrival measurement between G node B1 and G node B2 that passes through the location of the U. So if you have multiple hyperbolas, the intersection of these hyperbolas you provide a unique U location. So this is how TDOA works. And it was standardized for downlink and multi RTT. Multi, the, as I, the previous time difference of arrival works conceptually based on intersection of hyperbolas, time difference, multi-RTT works based on intersection of circles. The GPS works this way. You just have one-to-one, -one, you know, the distance measurement with multiple, with the multiple base stations. It's not really the time difference measurement. 
and you get multiple circles and the intersection of these circles provide you uh, the location, new location. And this procedure called multi-PR, typically you need to do a round trip time with multiple base stations to get multi multiple circles. So this was also standardized for the first time, how it would work actually in the network. Because one thing, it's not easy to specify standardize these things because the, these a positioning has to coexist with the primary work of the network and that is communication. You know, so how to fit in uh, positioning with the ongoing communication uh, features and many other features also. These are, these are big challenges. And uh, so you find ways to make these things work and then those are specified as standards. Multi RTD angle based methods I've discussed before. And as releases will go on 5G, 6G, as the frequencies will increase, number of antennas will, will increase, angle based methods will become more and more stronger. You know, in 60 will be more stronger. That's because, uh, you know, we are moving from low frequencies to high frequencies. People are talking sub terahertz also. So the angular measurements will further improve and the angle based measurements. And there are some nice. The theoretical analysis uh, uh, or comparison or you know, a lot of things lies in theory here. Uh, the way they work, these angle-based methods, uh, timing-based methods, etc. Sometimes, sometimes certain scenarios, some one particular method is good, some other scenario, some other method is good. Easy methods, as I said, getting more and more power. A base station has more and more information of the UE without involving you in a positioning procedure. So this is like locating a UE comes for free to the base station, just based on the parameters it collects for communication purposes, for example. If that is also good enough to localize you. And these are, I'm just telling you on a high level, very high level. Okay, and these are called ESIP methods. And they are seen uh, efficient from the resource consumption point because you really do not need to involve UEs. Base station knows uh, by itself where the UE might be located. And of course, now the accuracy for these methods are also increasing. A lot of signals, measurements, methods, I will not go into detail because time is less. I want to talk to you about what's very little performances. Maybe this is various, you see various scenarios. There are three scenarios considered in it is 16. Indoor open office, urban micro, like Manhattan or city type scenario, urban macro, more rural kind of scenarios. And what I've shown is variety of positioning accuracy scenarios here. And you see 90% accuracy I've shown. You, know, you see the variety of accuracies uh, which were discussed. Uh, you know, in this. For example, indoor open office with multi RTT, you can get uh, 70 centimeters. Indoor open office, FR2, high frequency, millimeter, you can get 20 meter accuracies. So 20 centimeter accuracies. So the indoor, uh, if you use multi, uh, you know, a multi RTD, it requires 20 centimeters of accuracies. Urban macro and outdoor, the kind of accuracies we talk of is, uh, uh, say, for example, without interference, urban macro, without interference, 3.4 meters. So you can locate a user outside. Uh, you know, with the you know more ur urban macro kind of environment with 3.4 meters of, of accuracy, and urban micro like a more city type environment uh, without interference 1.5 meters and with interference 1.9 with two meters accuracies, and you can get uh, just with base stations. So this is what we talk of base station can provide you this level of accuracy uh, you know, now with 5G, and there's no GPS in here. Yes. Release 17, really after release 16, release 17 came, a lot of things were discussed, accuracies were improved, uh, you know, and as I said, uh, uh, release 17 was specifically targeted for industrial IoT use cases, right? factories, inside you want to automate factories, and then you need good positioning accuracies of devices in the factory. And with, if you mount uh, uh, indoor base stations, uh, then you can get uh, good accuracy. For example, what you see in accuracy is just one meter, 0.2 meters, etc. And the latency also is very important in 5G. And the kind of latency is required, you know, requirement will also put, and all these requirements are met. So you can say at least 17 ended up providing 20 centimeter with 10 millisecond accuracy indoors. 
in the indoor was the main use case which was concerned. And I said, we've discussed before, more and more work on integrity and reliability, et cetera, were brought in in early 17 and still continue. My, in my opinion, uh, integrity, reliability, and position is much, much tougher and topic and than the, you know, the position which we're doing so far. It's very difficult to provide uh, integrity. And there are various KPIs of integrity and reliability. Those are being discussed. I'm not going to this. These things are release 17 stuff. And I want to, uh, before ending, release 18, which is going on in right now. So a, a new things are popping up in uh, positioning. And a uh, you know, you know, lot of this kind of completely new things. And I think these are going to change uh, positioning a lot. So in the beginning, in the picture, what Sujit helped uh, with, um, the picture I had shown you, RSE, roadside units, as I said, UEs could be mounted besides the U, besides the road. So one thing which is coming up in standardization is side link. So UEs can talk to them, you know, talk among themselves. I use to use close by, they need not go through the base station for the run. They could talk to each other. And that it has a big consequences and position, uh, you know, because uh, you can do ranging to UEs among themselves can do distance estimation between them. And uh, that's a big thing. So in release 18, one big thing is being standardized, discussed, sometimes a bit controversial also, uh, is uh, how UE to UE link can help in position. What all needs to be specified? What all needs to be done? A lot of concepts are coming in, a lot of new things, uh, methods, new signals, new procedures, many things are coming up in this. Quite a, Complicated topic, um, but uh, I think it's going to provide uh, very good accuracy as well. So that's one thing being discussed in release 18. There are other things are also being discussed in release 18. There's, uh, uh, you know, as I said, rat integrity, new signals, and there's one. Maybe in this slide I see that. Yes, uh, one thing. There's. Again, some emphasis on IoT providing positioning for IoT devices, but then they are called red cap devices, reduced capacity devices. And then they are not really the IoT devices of the previous generation, 4G generation. They are IoT devices of 5G generation. That means these IoT devices also have the bandwidth which are usual normal 4G UE have. So in 5G, IoT, you can say it's, you know, uh, would be auto devices can be as powerful as the normal UVs in 4G. And a lot of a lot of uh, standardization work is being done on that. Many, some standardization work is done on phase-based position. And uh, there is a, you know, hope that that can provide extremely good accuracy. Maybe sub centimeter. There's a lot of discussions on going on in that as well. So in release 18, the more, and which is, this is the ongoing work, uh, no, ongoing release, which is going on right now. Side link based positioning is the main thing. Side link based positioning, and then more work on integrity, reliability, uh, reduced capacity devices, and carrier phase based positioning, et cetera, are going on. What lies ahead? And one more thing, just I wanted to say one thing. So the, the side link positioning, the main use case for which the side link positioning is being discussed, standardized, is vehicular use case. It's because the side link may, would make the biggest difference there because the cars, uh, as I said, the use can talk to each other. Use can do distance estimation among each other. And this can be very useful for cars on road, like roads, for example. And uh, again, maybe it would, I'll go back to the, oh, sorry. First, the picture which Sujit helped with. That is, uh, sorry, I had to scroll many slides. But here, I will, this is maybe worth scrolling these slides. So you see that these cars are on the road. Uh, they can talk to each other. This is a link I shown, PC5. PC5 is essentially interface between two uh, UEs. Uh, they talk on PC5. And they can do ranging also on PC5. And as I said, there's one important thing which is coming up in release 18 now. 
and that is RSU, road side units. You see in this picture, it is in this small RSUs and I have shown uh, uh, fixed mounted objects besides the road. They are used. And these use would talk to the cars. Cars are also used. And they will, that will be more a side link, uh, link, side link connection between cars and the RSUs. And network, and these RSUs will possibly, and all these IOUs will be connected to the network also. So network also has a big role to play there. Uh, but communication among cars, ranging distance estimation among cars, RSUs helping them. RSUs will act like, you know, uh, the base station would do in network based positioning as seen so far in time, transmit downlink signal, receive signals from the, from the user. So variety of positioning methods, et cetera, should be possible with the RSUs. And there's a, I could say a cousin of RSUs in cities, which is called PRUs, position referencing. They can be mounted within the cities besides the roads. So on highways for the RSUs, maybe a variant of this still being discussed, nothing formalized yet, but looks like a cousin of RSU that will be mount that will be available within the cities, more urban areas, et cetera. And that will, that's called PR, is positioning reference units. So positioning is changing a lot. It's going to change a lot with this uh, side link, et cetera, being possible. Okay, now again, I need to scroll many slides now. Let me go back to where I was. This 18 and what is it? Yes. So uh, that was uh, release 18 with RSU, siding, etc. So what lies ahead? So release 19 will start next year and then 60 will start. What's being discussed now in the, for release 19 and 60? Uh, you know, what I hear from all the places, like even academia is uh, this concept of joint communication, JCAS, sometimes abbreviated as. And JCAS is uh, uh, the 90% of use cases, what I have seen is mostly about location estimation, radar. Radar, your mobile radar is going to uh, come up in, you know, in mobiles and base stations, et cetera. And what do you use radar for finding of this location estimation, but more a passive location estimation, it will be. So, what I see as of now, um, the most or uh, you know, biggest set of use cases, which is being discussed in JCAS in 60, is essentially also location estimation. But may not be, uh, you would like to uh, locate a passive object, which is not participating in position, but based on the reflected signals, etc. Uh, so that's the JCAS is going to come in. And, yeah, I think it's, as of now, it looks more like an extension of position, let's say. And then many new things are coming up. Uh, drones, big thing. Uh, you would like to know location of drones more than you would like to use location for, use drones for estimating locations, etc. There are use cases for public safety. Uh, this is also being discussed now. There's public safety, uh, a building catches fire. Uh, you know, how you would like to locate, localize first responders inside the buildings. Because many times these first responders, you know, they, or most of the, what I've what I read in literature, that many first responder deaths are because in smoky environment, they are not able to localize where they are. Sometimes these first responders are next to the exit, but they cannot find the exit and, you know, and do not survive uh, because they do not know where they are. So it's very important that, uh, or for other people also, not need not be first responder. So it's a, that's one example of first responder of the public safety scenario. So the positioning is very important in public safety application also. And drones can help a lot. Too. The concepts like uh, if a building has, big building has caught fire, then drones will assemble around the building and provide positioning signals to uh, UEs, first responder people, et cetera, inside the building and help them come out of building and help them in you know, say, you know, saving their lives, et cetera. So positioning with drones is going to be a big thing as an anti and non-terrestrial network. This is also a big discussion. Now. They are uh, in low Earth orbit satellites. And they would participate in positioning. Maybe they will augment the GPS 
and this is but this discussion is at very high level right now just very uh, we fewer discussions but i think it's going to come as well and then uh, there there are a lot of uh, discussions up i think it's still very open uh, what all kind of things may come in today's 19 and 60 and it is being discussed right now thank you so much for the uh, very fascinating talk very informative and uh, uh, it was uh, of course beyond our imagination that there is so much uh, to talk about in positioning uh and uh, yeah i i feel like uh, more informed today uh, there are uh, a couple of questions from uh, roland maybe i can uh, i can read yeah, it exactly so roland would you like to read them out yeah sure sure uh, first of all thank you very much that was a very interesting talk and i uh, learned a lot about localization it's important also for my work because i also work on or I'm very interested in autonomous self driving cars and then localization is one of the key features you need for that so um when you uh, talked about about the uh, consortium 3g 3gpb um i was wondering how does the, this committee deal with delays uh, if uh, you know teams cannot meet the timeline is it very managed in a very strict way uh, how are new timelines being negotiated if they just see it's too tight they will not be able to release sorry again i want to understand what delays you're talking is it the latency of positioning no no, no 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 i'm not talking about the technology i'm talking about the process and the groups so within this committee how do they handle that i know a little bit how for example the working party 29 of the un ece in automotive handles that so i was wondering in the telecommunication sector how does the committee handle delays and delivery of uh, the teams that are all part of the standardization process so if some teams say we have not been able to uh, draft uh, to get the draft out uh, there are some issues there are some technical issues or some testing has to be done so we're not ready how do they deal with that okay so uh, you are essentially talking about the way of working of cgp yes the way of working the, exactly of the, of the consortium that uh, yeah, exactly. what if some company says you know we are not ready yet yeah and we need exactly. more time uh, for concepts to break in <laughs> i think it doesn't work that way because these schedules for example uh, a release 18 is ongoing and uh, the timings of the meetings are already fixed which month mm -hmm. with date and you need to provide uh, all the company need to provide their contribution one week prior to the meeting starts and mm -hmm. uh, there is no uh, you know uh, nothing like uh, you know some company can ask for stand you know for the deadlines to Mm -hmm. extend extension of that mm -hmm. no it doesn't work doesn't work that way. you have to give you know it's very clear it's very fixed and if the, if some company however important big or whatever it is mm -hmm. uh, but has to adhere to the uh, these mm -hmm. contract deadlines and i think i have never seen any issues in uh, maybe past uh, many years i have been working on this regarding this mm -hmm. yeah. okay yeah Because interesting to for to yeah. specify to specify any cons any any uh, feature there's so many mm. companies involved mm. and it's 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 the contrary you know <laughs> i think many times these uh, pace of these best standardization work uh, in my opinion it goes faster than you would have predicted it okay yeah. that happens That's more often. that happens yeah. more often because uh, because because these every company and they you know there's a lot of uh, economic things also incentives involved with that if every company wants to push their concepts mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. because uh, a comp if a company has more concepts uh, in standard mm -hmm. then more of their patents will be useful and uh, there is a directly in, you know economic uh, incentives there for companies to be more proactive and try to bring in more concepts to the standards so mm -hmm. uh, it's i have never come across uh, this kind of thing where uh, someone says mm, uh, you know uh, no mm. no because then it will be maybe uh, 
Okay, maybe I cannot. Uh, so yeah, but thank you. Very, very interesting insight into the working yes. of the, the committee. Yes. The yes. second question I have is on cybersecurity. Yes. Um, so when you look at localization, it is obviously very important for, uh, for example, for self-driving cars. And mm -hmm. there's a concern about the cybersecurity of the mechanisms of any geo information being delivered. Um, mm -hmm. Could you comment on that? Just you know, a broad uh, perspective on um, the cybersecurity topic of that. I think uh, uh, you know, I can say that I'm not an expert on this. I know because uh, uh, what we have discussed in today's talk is a RAN standardization. Mm -hmm. is essentially radio access network standardization. Mm -hmm. And for security, there is a separate group which works uh, in, you know, in 3GPP. Oh, yeah, okay. The, you know, and that service and architecture. And that's completely different. <coughs> and, uh, I have not much, I know they do their work. There's a separate group mm -hmm. working on that. Mm -hmm. But I have not much uh, knowledge. And, you know, it, it won't be right for me to comment on that. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, Satyam. Yes. Uh, in case uh, uh, there are any other questions from anybody in the audience, please feel free to ask. Sujat, so, may I? Yes, sure. Sure, uh, Sridhar. Uh, Satyam, uh, thanks very much yes. for a very interesting talk. I have two questions. Uh, yes. One is, see, I have seen that uh, for GPS, the usage error rate uh, is around 2.0 meters, that's on the average, that's what they are saying, uh, using the GPS. Uh, now, you have uh, said that uh, the accuracy uh, in location yes. positioning using 3GPP networks can be between 2 and 3 meters. And in fact, it is less than 1 or roughly 1.5 within in, in indoor. So, uh, you know, the, the, the question that I'm asking is that uh, countries, including India, have launched the regional uh, navigation systems. So is GPS going to be outdated, right? I mean, the global positioning system using satellites satellites are going to be outdated because of 3GPP, uh, you know, uh, accurate location. That is the first question. The second question is, uh, as you know, the release 21 uh, of 6G is going to be somewhere around uh, 2027, right? And uh, molecular communication, uh, including biosensors, are expected okay. to take part as a major way in this. Now, okay. is it possible to locate a sensor using a 3GPP network in the body using molecular communication precisely, right? Use, you know, excluding this uh, radio uh, frequencies, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so these are my two questions. Uh, but excellent presentation and thanks very much. Yes. So the first question uh, would the GNSS in general? Uh, uh, be out, will it be outdated ever? So <clears throat> I think as of now, I don't foresee that. I uh, you know having working in positioning for past uh, you know, one and a half decades now. And uh, the thing is often what I see rather is augmenting GNSS with 3GPP. Uh, because uh, the positioning is one thing, it suffers from certain error sources which are very hard to alleviate or, you know, uh, for example, no line of sight. You know, base station still needs line of sight. And ideally, what would be the solution of that, that you provide, you, you know, deploy a very large number of base stations everywhere so that no region is no line of sight. Everyone in every line of every region, you have at least a few base stations line of sight. But that can be expensive, not very practical. Uh, so there is, a, you know, you cannot cover the complete earth also. Network is not available everywhere, you know, uh, deep sea, many other places, and network is not available. And uh, then, so yeah, these are the things. And of course, GNSS is a uh, very low cost solution and, uh, you know, present everywhere, you know, already it has reached, you know, that's the best example of positioning, uh, the GNSS, GPS. And uh, everyone is now hooked to it, you know, people cannot survive without a GPS nowadays. It has shown to be so useful. So I do not think it will go away. And that's a different, if you see, it's a, uh, these two, as a technology wise, they are more complementary, not competitive. You know, uh, providing signals from high up in the satellite, you know, has different, uh, even if you write mathematical equations, you know, it's very different. 
uh, when, when you provide signals you know, from terrestrial base stations. You cannot say that you can substitute that with that. No, no, no. I do not see that will, uh, you know, uh, these uh, uh, will be complete. Of course, in indoor, yes. Indoor GNSS do not penetrate it. And there, these uh, base station based positioning has, uh, you know, a very high value. And the second question you are on molecular communication and uh, sensing. Uh, getting into 6G and the network, would the, the role network can play there. You know? Essentially, you are asking, can you do indoor body sensing with the radio waves transmitted from the genomes, for example? You know, that's very, I think, uh, uh, good thought. <laughs> uh, maybe you know, people at people at Ericsson would like it to do that. Uh, you know, uh, and but uh, I I also work in you know my 50% work is in propagation. I'm a propagation scientist, so basic electromagnetic propagation, etc. So I do believe uh, that. Uh, so it's like this. One more other way of putting it is that mostly need drives the innovation, and need drives the you know what comes. In. So far, it has been communication. You know, that okay, let's try to have more and more communication. But I see a radio has so much of hidden potential. Uh, you know, which has not been explored because there has not been so much of need of it. You know, once the need comes, people do start feeling that they would, they do need it. I think those, you know, in my opinion, possible potential of radio waves, I think can definitely be explored. And if those things come up and then they would come in standards. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Satyam, I have one question. Uh, yes. Similar to a, a way of working kind of question. Yes. So how how does the uh, standardization committee decide the scope of a particular standard? Because uh, two, three things that you mentioned, for yes. example, industrial IoT and vehicular mm -hmm. uh, positioning, uh, yes. to a layman like me, they appear very different applications. Yes. How do they decide that we should uh, focus on such and such things? Yes, so uh, there are various ways of looking at it. Uh, so that, uh, you know, there are signals or influences come from several directions, even from academia. I would say, what's hot in academia, academic research, for example, you write you're writing many people because researchers like me and most of us, you know, do have academic connections. We do read papers. We do know what's latest, what's coming up. That also influences a lot. That's one thing. Second thing is, of course, market. What kind of products should come in? And you, we want to build standards for that. That also comes in. And then uh, the way it happens is, you know, at high level, there are various levels at which these discussions are done. If uh, for before a release starts uh, with certain use case, it, it takes a few years of discussions uh, to come to that level. In different groups, it all starts. It starts very loosely. Okay, let's start. The, the, you know, at some groups in 3GPP, you know, they are called, for example, SA1 group. Their work itself is to discuss use case and requirements. What can possibly be done? For example, now the JCAS work is being done in that level on JK, you know, on the use case discussion. Where if you look at those contributions, which is done now. Because JCAS would come for RAND standardization, radio standardization, possibly next year or the year after. So before that, what's going on is it's just brainstorming of the use case and what can be done, etc. So all companies bring in those kind of ideas. And, and these discussions, these ideas are, are very high level. Sometimes to me, it looks like many of those things are fairy tale or you know, uh, some science science fiction, if you read those contributions. And it's sometimes very fantastic to read those things. It's, like bring in whatever you can kind of discussion sometimes. And then different companies bring in those fantastic ideas, many motivating use, oh, it can be used this way, it can be used this way, that kind of thing. And then there's a brainstorming and it involves Sujit, maybe, you know, thousands of researchers worldwide in different companies in industrial research. And in may in nowadays in academia also, uh, for example, in India, this uh, I know a few IITs are involved in this. Uh, 
uh, discussions. They do participate in three GDP meetings as well. So uh, these uh, at that high level discussions, you, and see, ultimately, our standard has to evolve because as standard coming out on standard is benefits everyone who whoever is participating. So, however, people can argue, you know, not agree to each other. But finally, finally, everyone knows that they have to come up with something for everyone to be benefited from. Otherwise, things won't work. And then no one you know, has any gains from it. So that's how it is. It's a lot of brainstorming, starts at very high level, people bring in, and then you know, the chairs of these brainstorming sessions, they start to, you know include, exclude things, and then this is how it slowly converges. Hope I make you understand, made you understand a bit. Yes, yes. Uh, yes but it's a, it's a fascinating big machine. A lot of researchers brainstorming, and uh, not in the meetings, there's a, these research groups are back offices. A lot of researchers in the back office are providing input from there to the people who are attending these meetings. But overall, I think finally, it's still based on the consensus, right. even though the group is large. Yes. Okay. So, uh, Satyam, I would like to thank you once again for coming over and presenting your talk to us. It was uh, very helpful and uh, we would like to hear more from you uh, in future. So let's keep talking. Maybe this will open uh, some uh, roads to collaborations, collaborative research later on. Perfect. Uh, I would definitely be uh, <clears throat> very optimistic about that. So thank you. With that, thank you. Uh, I would like to close the session. Thank you.